Hello again. We are proceeding with the first Kharkiv International Security Forum, and we are reaching the last, but not the least, <laughs> the last panel, which will be uh, uh, proceed, uh, will, which will proceed in English. However, I will give a floor to the Professor Rushenka, who will greet the participants, and after the short introduction, we will be happy to hear our foreign guests. Ну, власне, наш форум добігає кінця, але у нас є ще одна цікава панель міжнародна. Користуємося перевагами цифрового зв'язку і соціума, в якому ми вже живемо. І до нас підключаються експерти з питань безпеки і з питань гібридної війни з різних країн Європи. Так що будемо спостерігати, можна ставити питання і приймати участь в обговоренні. Доброго дня. Thank you. We are already discussed the Ukraine experience in the hybrid war, and now I'm looking forward to learn more about um, international examples and international experience um, in this question. So my thanks to the panelists. Thank you for your time and thank you for your inputs and, of course, greetings from Kharkiv. Thank you, Brigitta. And I would like to like begin uh, or to prime our participants a bit. We had a lot about the internal Ukrainian experience or even some international experience, but what we really need to hear or we would like to hear is uh, how Ukraine is perceived from abroad. Uh, because I think that what we actually saw all together during those two days is that somehow we la lack interception of Ukraine. So thank you very much. And we are looking forward uh, hearing from you. And we have um, volunteers who are sitting there with um, uh, computers, they are ready to take uh, questions uh, because of the digital uh, nature of our conversation. They will be able just to uh, put uh, questions or remarks in a written form and our participants will see them in Zoom. So please uh, um, stand up. Uh, you see the uh, here is our uh, volunteer who will help you with uh, posting a question and communicating with our participants. Thank you. And we are ready to start. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, welcome to online panel uh, of- oh, And uh, you, can, you will see now our moderator. His name is Andrei Karakuts. He is- uh, uh, with us from Kyiv, and he will start the panel. Uh, thank you, Natalia. Do you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, welcome to this online panel um, uh, organized by uh, uh, of 4th uh, Kharkiv International Security Forum, organized by Konrad Adenauer Foundation and Maidan Monitoring Information Center. Uh, and um, as Natalia said, I will be moderator of this panel named Ukraine and its partners together against hybrid threats. Uh, very relevant topic regarding current situation in Eastern Europe. Uh, and in this panel, we have renowned international experts. Um, uh, I will introduce each everyone in uh, them in the order of appearance, uh, and then we will proceed to presentations. Uh, but first, about our format, uh, each speaker will have uh, 15 to 20 minutes, and the last 30 minutes uh, of the event will be devoted uh, to questions from the audience, and um, as organizers told me, uh, this question will be in the Zoom chat. Uh, so, I would like first to introduce our speakers. Um, the first one, Mr. Glenn Grant, uh, international reform consultant and defense expert uh, with the Baltic Security Foundation. Uh, his topic is Ukraine is an island surrounded by stormy seas. Uh, then we will continue to Ms. Uh, Emily uh, 
Stelz na Dogan, a policy advisor for German Armed Forces and Civil Affairs at Konrad Adenauer Foundation in Berlin. Uh, her topic, fake news, disinformation and Bundeswehr. Uh, then uh, Ms. Natalia Albu, director of Strategic Research Center, Legal, Political and Sociological Research Institute, Minister of Education, Culture and Research of Moldova. Uh, her topic, security issue of the Republic of Moldova in the context of hybrid threats. And finally, Mr. Andreas Kundland, analyst of the Stockholm Center for Eastern European Studies at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs with the topic information wars and distant risk of Ukraine European integration. Um, so now I would like to give the floor to our first speaker. So Mr. Grant, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Andre. I hope you can hear me. Uh, okay, everybody. Yes, good. Um, this is a, a Quite interesting. Uh, right now, I'm not far too far from Andreas, as I'm actually in Finland, uh, down in Turku, waiting to celebrate Independence Day on on Monday with a with a dinner with friends. <clears throat> and uh, so I have plenty of time to think about the the, the trip here. But then, uh, on the trip here, driving. But uh, I hadn't actually thought about that one point that uh, that Natalie raised about you know how other people view. Uh, view this this whole state of affairs, if you can call it that. Um, and I, I my t title, my theme was 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 uh, Ukraine effectively surrounded by stormy seas. So I, I want to just do a run round, and I will start with a, a, a stormy sea down in the Sea of Azov. Uh, and what I want to do is, as I just go around, is just pick up something or a point from each area. Um, that you might say uh, is a weakness or is, is something that people will look at and say, well, that's strange, that's normal, that's okay, this is a, a weak area for hybrid warfare. And when we look at the, um, the, the Azov Sea, the first thing that, that comes to my mind is why on earth is anybody spending uh, huge amounts of money on French ships for the border guard? Uh, when you're a country at war, um, a border guard in the Azov Sea is... is um, actually just frankly just wasting money and and you know when britain is looking at talking about providing missile boats uh, they look at they look at, at, at the, the border guard and the interior and say you know what what game is this because you know 23 boats it's just a waste of money why not 10 more missile boats that can go in the azov sea and actually do something what are the border guard going to do around there that the Navy is not going to do first? So this is a, the sort of thing that, 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 that immediately springs to my mind when I look at Azov. Um, going around Crimea, the good bit about Crimea is the, is the recent Crimea Forum. Uh, and that, that at last is actually beginning to look at uh, Crimea, what can be done about Crimea. And uh, the, the former minister, Andrew Zagorodniuk, has taken, taken this all seriously. And his, uh, his institute is actually looking at uh, all the ways that Russia can be affected or that Russia has done something wrong, ranging from you know, economic to legal. And they're now studying all those areas that they can now take Russia on uh, in a non-military fashion. Uh, and now you might call this reverse hybrid warfare. Uh, but actually, this is what Putin has been doing down uh, to, to Ukraine solidly, is taking Ukraine on in areas that Ukraine uh, was not ready to be taken on because they hadn't thought of them. And now, uh, hopefully, with the Crimea platform, uh, it, Putin will start getting some of his own back uh, through the international community and international courts on things that he's done wrong there. Uh, and of course, you know, when you then move into the Black Sea, um, this is really important because of the gas uh, and the oil reserves around under the Black Sea. So, so Putin has stolen an awful lot. It is stormy seas down there because although NATO comes in and out, there is no NATO standing force in the Black Sea, uh, sadly. And you have to ask yourself why, whether that's because the Turks don't want it. But I would add that, that if we jump down to the Black Sea coast down the side, 
we have two countries in Romania and Bulgaria, both of whom have overcooked their defence budgets, neither of whom can afford to put a ship to sea for long periods in a standing defence force. And this is, a, this is an area of, of weakness. And do people look at this standing defence force? Yeah, I tell you, they do. You know, Americans and Brits and other people who are bringing their ships into the, the Germans who bring their ships into the Baltic are wondering why Bulgaria and Romania are not pulling their weight in this area. Well, they're not because of the money. Um, and maybe this is an area where Ukraine should have been spending more time negotiating with NATO to try and work out whether money can be moved from something from one thing to another. Uh, for example, uh, a, a fund that funds the Baltic, the, 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 uh, the, the Black Sea force. Um, so while we're on that, that side of the water, we go around the stormy seas and we come to Moldova and Transnistria. And I ask myself, why is Ukraine not taking more energy thinking about Transnistria? This is a key area. It's a key area there where hybrid warfare against Russia could really upset Russia on that side. And it's an area where Russia is weak because to get things in and out of Transnistria is not easy. Um, and the hybrid warfare look there could be something with Romania, Moldova and Ukraine that basically puts a pressure, a gentle pressure on, onto Transnistria. Um, uh, and looking at, you know, can we isolate it completely? I mean, there are still aircraft flying into Moldova with Russians in them who get out in the air, airfield in Chisinau and then go across the, across the river to, to, to Transnistria. Why, I ask? You know, there must be ways of, of actually putting pressure in this regard, reverse hybrid warfare on Moldova. But moving back to Romania and Bulgaria, they are both in that stormy seas on that side. And really the relationship with Ukraine with both of them is weak. Um, and it should be better because, the, because this is the, the, some better than just conversational, better than just conversational uh, agreements. It actually needs some hardness to it uh, down that side, because again, anything that improves the relationship Ukraine-Bulgaria is a pressure on Russia. Anything that improves the relationship Ukraine-Romania uh, is, a, is, a, is a pressure on Russia. And if you then add, going further around, and just talking about Hungary for a few minutes, I mean, the relationship with Hungary is not good. That has to be fixed. That has to be fixed because it's not good to have, to be building, spending money on building barracks facing Hungary, putting extra Ukrainian troops in barracks facing Hungary because you're worried about a NATO EU member. Uh, and, and the far side of Russia. Now, this may be part of Russia's hybrid warfare. It may not. It may just be Hungary being bloody minded uh, about their Hung Hungarian minority. But it's still something that needs to be solved because it's money that is being wasted, putting people where they do not need to be, putting soldiers where they don't need to be. And then we move around and we keep going around the stormy waters. An, an area of calm is Slovakia. Um, but I jump back, Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, Slovakia, and Poland, all of those are NATO and EU members. They have a vote. They have a vote in NATO. And if you can collect all of those on your side and working positively with you, then you are advantaged in the NATO forum and advantaged in the EU forum. And so Slovakia is worth doing something with. It should not be the one area of calm. It should be an area that the country does something positively to help Slovakia, whether that's helping Slovakian defense forces progress, 
because I promise you that uh, Ukraine defense forces do not need support and help from Slovakia. It's the other way around. Um, but it's a vote and Ukraine should be looking hybrid for that vote because that vote is important. We move around to Poland. And Poland has got a good relationship, as good a relationship as you're going to get with, with, with Ukraine of anybody, um, especially as they, they, they have a joint brigade with Lithuania. Uh, and there are lots of positive moves backwards and forwards. And the, Pol the Polish support for the defense forces is, and always has been since the war started, one of the brightest bits uh, of all the countries working into working into Ukraine. And they've been really positive about what they do. Uh, and it's a less of a stormy sea than perhaps some of the others. But Poland has got its own stormy sea with Belarusia. Um, but someone last night, it was quite funny because I was sitting here thinking about talking about stormy seas and a, a, a colonel in the uh, Defence Forces wrote to me and said, if the Belarusians cross the border into Ukraine, uh, will Poland come and help fight with us? And of course, I chuckled to myself and I had to write and say, no, they're not going to come unless something completely dramatically happens, such as Belarus attacks Poland at the same time as Ukraine, um, which is highly unlikely. Um, but uh, but it's just interesting that someone uh, in, in, a, in a, a fighting unit should actually wonder about this uh, uh, and not know what the relationship with Poland is at this stage. Now, you could say, there's no relation, no stormy sea with Poland, but there is, and that stormy sea is the border. And if you've driven through the Polish-Ukrainian border, trust me, the line of lorries is absolutely monstrous. There is no common sense provided on the border to deal with industry, to deal with business whatsoever. So what have you got? Ukraine is losing a couple of million dollars, euros a day on the border because it doesn't actually sort out how to actually a process of working with Poland to actually to get lorries in and out properly. So you've got on one side, you've, you've effectively got a horrible dirty toilet as lorry drivers sit there for two days waiting to get through. I move on from Poland to Belarus. Belarus, as the defense minister said in the empty parliament yesterday, uh, uh, it's Anschluss. Uh, Belarus has been taken over by Russia. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, it's now pretty obvious. Uh, and does that mean, mean that they now fight on behalf of Russia? Well, I think they do. So the whole of that border has now suddenly become a border that the defence forces have to worry about. And of course they are. Um, and it's a long one too. I mean, I think it's nearly a thousand kilometres because it's, it weaves in and out. The good bit is it's awfully, it's actually a lot marshy and horrible around there. And there are not actually very many places to cross. But that's a stormy sea that could get more stormy very quickly. And then of course, I come to Russia. I notice on the internet about an hour ago that someone or that the American, someone in America has said there are now 175,000 uh, American troops, uh, American, 175,000 Russian troops now sitting on the border. Now, whether that 175,000 includes 40,000 or 20,000 Belarusians, I have no idea. But the numbers are going up. And that stormy sea on that side is clearly very, very stormy. Um, and I think that jumping back round to the other countries, and the rest of the way around the stormy sea that, that if you can make some of those others calm and the relationship stronger, it would make that, that, that the, the, the equation for Russia much more difficult. Because I think that, you know, were Russia to gain back Ukraine, there would then be these four or five uh, NATO countries alongside and not very happy NATO countries. And I will finish just by saying that the Stormy Sea should perhaps uh, also include the other side of Belarus with the three Baltics. 
and that Ukraine should spend more time actually linking with those because they are in the same state. They are also under pressure from Russia. They are also under pressure from, uh, uh, from Belarus. And again, they have a NATO vote and they have an EU vote. And those things are important. And on that point, I shall finish. Thank you very much, Mr. Grant. Uh, uh, I am sure that you uh, uh, will have many questions uh, for your speech. Uh, but now we will move uh, to our next uh, speaker, uh, Ms. Uh, Amelie uh, Stenzner-Dogan. Uh, uh, she is uh, from Konrad Adenauer Foundation. And uh, Emily, do you hear us? Yes? Uh, yes. The floor is yours. Thank you. So hello to you all and thank you very much for the kind introduction and thanks for uh, the invitation and I'm happy well at least to meet you all virtually. And I was asked to uh, speak about Russian disinformation campaigns against Germany, against the German armed forces and NATO and of course instruments to withstand such attacks. Do you hear me all well? Yes, okay, perfect. So. Um, to start with, that we are all on the same page, um, I'm using the term disinformation and not fake news because fake news is just politically a politically loaded term. And um, therefore I'll concentrate on disinformation and what me disinformation I'm gonna use, or I usually define it um, this way um, as the German Ministry of Defense defines it. And they say, it's a type of propaganda in which untrue information is disseminated by the sender with the intent to harm. So this is important because the intention is to harm. And this is the separation between misinformation and malinformation um, because there are a lot of different types of propaganda. So I'd like to start um, um, with my first point with disinformation in Germany, because First of all, why are we actually talking about Germany? In March 2021, so just half a year ago, a study was released by EU versus Disinfo. Um, I'm going to talk about um, EU versus Disinfo later on. But the important thing is it was um, identifying a systematic campaign against Germany by the Kremlin, uh, which is being played out at several levels. And um, important is no other EU member state is attacked um, as much as by disinformation than Germany, because the study has found that in the last six years, um, there were over 700 cases targeting Germany. And for example, against France, it was approximately around 300 cases, Italy more, but more than 150, and Spain just approximately 50 cases. So we can see this is a huge uh, difference and Germany is way more attacked by disinformation by Russia, by the Kremlin, than other member states of the European Union. And this is interesting because at the same time, um, Germany is described as a country supporting dialogue and there are a lot of strong uh, voices in German politics who are very much supporting uh, dialogue and cooperation with Russia and with strong economic ties. And obviously, it's kind of a double speak with the Kremlin as well, because on the one hand side, they are at least not all the time, but sometimes saying I'm interested about maybe we can come back in a discussion to it uh, about a commitment to that they have a commitment to dialogue and that they're uh, ready for talks. But then at the same time, there are those strong um, um, attacks, systematic campaigns against Germany. And so how are they actually attacking Germany? Just to say it broadly, within Germany, there are approximately around 3 million people who can actually speak Russian and um, or whose mother tongue is, uh, is uh, Russian. So they have like two different ways of how they can um, um, yes, um, influence the German um, population um, because of the Russian media as well. But um, there are state-owned Russian broadcasters within Germany, RT, so uh, Russia Today and Sputnik. And they actually have ambitious plans in Germany. And they're um, permanently increasing their budget. So 
for the next four years, um, news are saying that they are approximately 550 million euro um, for these two, um, for RT and Sputnik. So they are quite well known within Germany and quite well used. And um, especially um, what we have seen now with the COVID-19 pandemic, that they are um, supporting people who are against vaccination as well. And um, they have quite a large audience. And I'd actually like to give you an example of this information just to show you how far this actually can go. Um, this was in 2016. There was a German girl with Russian roots and she disappeared for one, for one day. And um, it's called the case Lisa. And um, when she returned, she said that she has been raped. And German and Russian media as well, so Russian media within Russia, yes, um, said that, um, so reported about it, and the Russian media said that Lisa was actually raped by refugees. And the situation escalated quite quickly. There were actually within Germany some small demonstrations, but nevertheless, there were some demonstrations. The media coverage was big and um, what is important about it is that even the Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, addressed the issue um, because he accused the German authorities that they are um, covering it up and that they are not getting into the issue and not taking it seriously enough. But what actually happened, the police obviously investigated it and um, they found out by using cell phone data um, that Lisa was at a friend's house and that she was just making up the story and yes, that the media kind of used it. And so um, it got quite big. It had a huge political implication with the um, back then Russian foreign minister getting into it. So it was a, um, yes, one disinformation getting on this, on this um, level uh, quite big. So this is just an example to show you what this information can actually do and on, yes, which starts on a slow level and gets quite um, big. And this is the civil side I was now talking about and now I'd actually like to come to the military um, um, side of this information because I guess you're all quite aware of the Mission Enhanced Forward Presence. There are four multinational battle groups in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland. And the battle group in Lithuania is uh, led by Germany. And especially at the beginning of the mission, there was quite a lot of disinformation. And um, the NATO Stratcom Center classifies Lithu Lithuania as a moderately severe target for disinformation of the part of Russia, because we're talking again about disinformation probably coming um, from Russia, Russia close to the Kremlin and um, related sources. And um, of course, the background of this is that it's a strategic location as its neighboring country of Kaliningrad and Belarus. And as you are all aware of the background of the enhanced forward presence is, um, that it was um, set, up, uh, set up after the backdrop of Russia's annexation of Crimea. And therefore, from the Russian perspective, well, I, I think I do not need to go into detail, but um, therefore, um, the Lithuanian and the um, German uh, armed forces are aware of disinformation and monitor it quite quickly closely. And nevertheless, I'd like to give you now two examples of uh, disinformation who were um, viewed in the media. And um, so the first example is that German soldiers were accused of raping an underage Lithuanian girl in front of a children's home in Jonova, which is not far away from Utla, uh, where the German uh, soldiers are um, and um, so the type of it was that an email to the Lithuanian parliament was sent and to the media and smaller Lithuanian media actually picked up the case. And it was also reported within Germany um, 
the origin still is not identified um, is, is not sure. So people are um, saying it might come from Russia, but it, we have to make sure that it's not identifiable. So um, because of the detailed description, the media and some people believed it. Um, but when you take a closer look at it, and the Lithuanian authorities did this quite uh, fast, this children's home doesn't even exist. But that, nevertheless, it was picked up and viewed within the media for a few days. And the second example is, um, this was in 2019, there was um, a picture of a German tank discriminating into a Jewish cemetery and um, destroying um, graves. And this was close to where the soldiers are stationed as well. And at the same day where this was supposed to happen, um, a battle group tank was actually driving close by. But nevertheless, it was quite fast that the Lithuanian um, authorities and um, the German armed forces identified this obviously as false. But um, nevertheless, I mean, now that we're actually talking about it, it was in the German media as well and in Lithuanian media. So this is a few examples how they were trying um, to, to um, uh, discrediting German soldiers and in a broader context, NATO as well. And why am I telling you this? This information has therefore a security impact because when um, it doesn't matter if it's the Lithuanians or the Germans do not um, support um, the armed forces, NATO armed forces, German armed forces, um, this can have a security impact. And um, therefore, it's always important to closely monitor disinformation. And uh, Germany actually does this. In 2016, the German's white paper, the strategic document, identifies cyber defense um, as a necessary and important condition for national security. And one of the 10 key challenges for term Germany uh, for German security policy. And um, we have um, within uh, Germany in 2017 set up a new unit within our German armed forces, the Bundeswehr, the so-called cyber and information domain service. And they have a a lot of um, different tasks at home and at the missions, as we have seen, because Germany is attacked by disinformation, and those are different with every mission. For example, in Afghanistan, it was propaganda by the Taliban, and uh, in Lithuania, it's disinformation aimed at discrediting German soldiers in NATO. So, but what is what are the German armed forces actually doing to combat disinformation? So, um, as I just said, there was a new unit and they increased personnel. And um, but in addition, they are cooperating with academia to identify disinformation and um, to develop instruments and strategies to counter and identify disinformation right when actually it is published. So they have set up a new um, a new um, project. It's called Propaganda Awareness. It has been running since 2018, and they are hopefully uh, able to implement it in 2022. And so what they want to do with it is that they uh, build up capabilities for analyzing and forecasting threat situations and appropriate tools um, to recognize uh, disinformation at an early stage and then to carry out targeted defense measures and build up a corresponding resistance in the cognitive area. So that the Bundeswehr is able to um, reliably recognize and um, to what extent actually soldiers are influenced by propaganda, especially during missions. And um, I'd like now to move on to NATO just shortly. We can maybe get back to it in the, um, later on in the discussion. But what NATO has, um, NATO has established the NATO Strategic Communication Center of Excellence. 
this is a multinational approach and communications, they are coordinated, they do a lot of research and the goal is to educate and inform the public, especially um, within NATO, to counter the force of disinformation and provide verified facts. So, for example, during the COVID-19 pandemic, Russia tried to develop different narratives, um, for example, like COVID-19 will break up NATO or NATO is failing to support allies in the fight against COVID-19. So they provided information. Why is Russia saying that? What is true about it? What is false about it? And at EU level, something similar exists. It's called EU versus disinformation. So they gather all the disinformation, they do research, and then they publish it and just give the background information about it because what they are saying is disinformation is sometimes difficult to detect. And so people can get all the information in order to verify whatever they found uh, in the media and uh, in the digital sphere. So to sum it up, what was important? Well, first of all, Germany, um, there are disinformation campaigns about Germany from Russia and Germany is the target within the European Union in comparison to other EU members like France and Italy. Then second of all, German soldiers are the goal of disinformation campaigns as well, as we have seen with the mission enhanced forward presence um, in Lithuania. And third of all, there are instruments at the different levels at, within Germany and at EU and natural level to counter this information. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the speech. Um, and uh, uh, now I want uh, to give the floor to our next speaker, uh, Ms. Natalia Albu uh, from Moldova. Uh, and uh, uh, she will uh, make a presentation. So Natalia, I will give your mic. Good afternoon for all. Thank you very much for the invitation. And um, I finished last minute my presentation. At the beginning, I didn't think about the PowerPoint presentation, but I came, came from um, academia. I'm not uh, only a researcher at the Strategic Research Center, but also I'm an associated professor at the Military Academy. But why it is a very good tool for me to share um, and academic approach on uh, hybrid free issues in the Republic of Moldova. Uh, in uh, my presentation, uh, in my presentation regarding the security issues of the Republic of Moldova in the context of hybrid free, I will address the following uh, topics. Uh, insecurity factors of the Republic of Moldova, vulnerabilities of the Republic of Moldova from the hybrid threats perspective, Russian irregular warfare tactics used uh, against the Republic of Moldova, the measure to prevent it and countering the um, hybrid threats, and new tendency in, in the um, Eastern Partnership area regarding to have uh, common response on uh, against hybrid threats. Uh, why insecurity factors? Um, I um, have his um, a terminological approach. I'm from academia. And the main um, problem always in the area of um, institutions or uh, in the academia, in general, in communication, it is the common understanding of uh, free. Common understanding about what is a hybrid uh, free. Common understanding regarding um, national interest. But why I think uh, for uh, it is specific for Republic of Moldova to have common understanding, not only regarding hybrid free, but but it is insecurity for the country because some threats uh, could uh, uh, are different for the country. For example, food security for Republic of Moldova ha uh, uh, has one perception. 
for, for the state from the Africa continent, it is another perception. But if you speak about insecurity, the insecurity of our neighbors, it is the insecurity for uh, my country or insecurity of my country, it is the insecurity for, for European Union. But why I chose in my presentation presentation, the insecurity as a factors in the context of hybrid war or hybrid threats, because the insecurity describe the context and the impact of hybrid threats on the state of security of Republic of Moldova. And think about that it is easier to measure insecurity than security, because the security is elusive it is difficult to measure and it is easier to show the free the state of insecurity of the country because now we have a lot of uh, indicators freedom how from freedom house regarding the state of democracy the state of freedom in the country now we have um, democracy resilience uh, indicators or women peace and security women security but why uh, in my presentation I uh, will emphasize the, this kind of approach in security helped me to show the interdependence between vulnerabilities, risk and threats in the Republic of Moldova. For example, uh, Transnistrian conflict, you know about this situation because we have this kind of fro so-called frozen conflict in the region. Uh, at the same time, for Republic of Moldova, it is a vulnerability and risk and threats. For example, in the context, context of uh, proactive uh, activities, it is a vulnerability. If you speak about uh, energy security, uh, this uh, situation uh, became a risk at the same, it could be a very important threat as a manipulation regarding national interest, political situation in the country. On the other hand, we have an interdependency between external and internal threats in the country. Internal, we are vulnerable. We have, um, sorry, approve. We have a perception that we are corrupted country. We have, um, since 2009, the domestic political landscape of Moldova has been frequently shaken by governmental crisis. Yes. At the same time, we are influenced by external threats as coronavirus pandemics, for example, or area of uh, Republic Moldova, it is an area of hybrid threats. And don't forget how it's so difficult to be a buffer state in the context of geopolitical approach and in the context of uh, geopolitical interest in the region of Russian Federation. Not strategical interest, but first of all, it is about geopolitical interest and the power interest in the region. And in this context um, of uh, correlation between internal and external threats of, of the country, uh, we have uh, the vulnerabilities that are very successful explored but actors as Russian Federation that aggravated or became more difficult to neutralize this kind of risk. For example, the perception that we are weak state, uh, capture state, at the same time that we have um, a separatism on our territory, the presence of Russian military forces, or uh, the perception of religious or ethnic te tension in the country. Um, so-called captive identities. Uh, political polarization still exists in Republic of Moldova after uh, uh, presidential election uh, in November two, 2020. We have polarized the societies because hybrid uh, free explorer successful our uh, this duality and this um, nostalgia, we can say, or on regarding the Soviet period. And also, I think it, it is our vulnerability neutrality, not it is a um, tools for our security. It is a tools for insecurity because we have misinterpretation of neutrality in the country. What is irregular war? 
regarding um, our perception. We don't have a common understanding regarding uh, irregular warfare. I think uh, this kind of perception, uh, it is at a regional level, international level, because we have a different terminology, hybrid freeze, irregular warfare, new generation of warfare or gray zone competition. Uh, it depends on tools or tactics that uh, the actor uh, state actor or non-state actor use in the region and their goals. And I will try to show you uh, the current situation in the Republic of Moldova. Um, now, we are, yes, we understand at the, at the level of experts, at the, at the institutional level that um, irregular warfare, it is not, it's not a new type of warfare. It is uh, at a strategy, we understand it is a strategy, uh, very successful applies in our country, I think in Ukraine too, and other uh, ex-Soviet uh, state, but we don't understand that it is comprehensive tools. It is a comprehensive strategy because military operation cannot defeat irregular tactics, but why? Uh, it is very important in the Republic of Moldova to understand that, that it is a multidimensional approach, multidimensional strategy, because we need to apply multidimensional or comprehensive uh, tools to defend and to counteract this kind of threats. If you speak um, Republic of Moldova, um, now we have a common understanding that uh, we have three kinds of targets of hybrid aggression in the country, population control, political leadership control, and territorial control. And uh, there are um, seven core, core uh, categories of strategy that support this kind of uh, targets. Economic, uh, government effectiveness, political stability, security, and uh, regional affairs. Um, in this context, I would like to emphasize that uh, this uh, category, free target uh, of hybrid uh, um, aggression, um, in terms of uh, their context of sustainability, reflect Moldavian conditions, and special if you speak about uh, the political, the, uh, the vector of foreign affairs. For example, as in Ukraine and in Georgia, it, it, it is the, it, it's the same situation. Uh, the hybrid attack against the Republic of Moldova, definitely be, it's used as um, our weakness regarding the collaboration with our partners as for example, USA, NATO, Europe Union. And uh, it's, uh, it is a vulnerability at the same time stop to promote our European integration. But why at the same time you have a perception regarding uh, the benefits, life, uh, uh, the benefits from European integration, but at the same time so we have um, geopolitics on vaccine geopolitics. People don't agree some uh, the Pfizer or other um, uh, vaccine, but they think about Sputnik because it's more safety for your health and our other arguments. But here you can see the mechanism uh, or um, type aggression, a, a logical diagram of mechanism regarding um, aggression, uh, hybrid aggression in the Republic of Moldova. And this kind of mechanism, I will show the example using very known financial problem. When in July 2012, Moldova media pointed out that the administration of the Russian president has posted a tender for a research on the influence of financial economic groups on the political process in the Republic of Moldova. A similar study was ordered on Latvia. The study had to be read, read it uh, by the end on uh, 2012, 2012. Perhaps 
Coincidentally, during 2012-2014, some massive money laundering scheme were run involving banks and Moldova in Moldova and Latvia. And beneficiary is Russian Federation. It must be mentioned that this apparent active measures operation aiming to undermine the financial system of Moldova and the trust of population in the government could not have been done without involvement of uh, corruption uh, uh, Moldavian officials. That's why I used this kind of security relation between different threats, vulnerabilities of the, of the country, corruption, uh, not have experience to understand how it is important to promote economical security, financial security, energy security in the country. And this kind of logical diagram help us to understand how to construct or how to build the counteracting mechanism. Also, uh, the tactics that um, Russian Federation, Russian regular warfare used against Republic of Moldova are the same as in Ukraine. We have some similar approaches, uh, but the main goal, it is to undermine adversaries and the um, adversary's ability, sorry, and the will to resist. The tools are the same, and you can see here, but I, do, I don't have enough time to describe uh, this kind of tool, but most important it is for Republic of Moldova that um, uh, the key goals, it is to consolidate uh, separatist regime in the country using soft power, hard power, intelligence activity too. Also, uh, why it is important for Republic of Moldova the gray zone approach or uh, gray zone activities, uh, as uh, in Ukraine or Georgia or uh, Nagorno situation, Nagorno Karabakh, it is cheaper to explore for a hybrid war, easy to avoid attribution or retribution, and um, it's very um, easy to explore the mind of population, the mentality of population. And uh, it is a very good instrument to apply um, and to, uh, it's a very good uh, tools to apply classic diplomacy and uh, geopolitical approach and to combine uh, military or, uh, or um, uh, so-called uh, hybrid threats in the region. And uh, in this spectrum of um, gray zone, uh, Republic of Moldova um, through Transnistrian uh, conflict is a source of insecurity, not at the national level, at also the regional level. Most importantly in this context, uh, that is uh, not only the instrument that hybrid, uh, free, uh, uh, hybrid fleets used, hybrid war used in the region, it's most important that we don't control the region even don't, we don't know the current situation. For example, situation called Basta Munition Depot. To, in our day, we discuss a lot about this situation. We can use as black swan in the region, for example, for terrorist attack to create a controlled house. And the Republic of Moldova, it is in this context very vulnerable, but at the same time, it can create a regional destabilization. At the regional level, it is very important, it can create a generated um, economical crisis or um, the, for example, incident at the regional level. What to do for it? First of all, we need that as the strategic level to have this balance between to understand problem and measure. Because we can understand problem, but you don't have enough capability to counteract hybrid threats. At the ten, same time, it's very important to now, so, or we have a partners in the region, but we don't understand problems. We don't recognize the threats. That's why at the strategic level, it's very important to recognize that hybrid war, or another terminology that we use regarding the, the new kind of war, it is to recognize that it's a threat for the country. 
Also, it's very important to recognize that not only military organization, uh, it is a threat for the country, also the, um, this kind of non-operational activities or exercise on the Transnistrian territory, else also it is a threat for Republic of Moldova. Also, we need to have a comprehensive approach because uh, hybrid threat it is a comprehensive um, uh, activities. It is very important to identify um, the instrument to promote the transparency of our program regarding fighting uh, anti, uh, to fight corruption. Because you know, now in our country, we have a special program. We integrated our policy in different, uh, in different national policy regarding uh, anti-corruption uh, activities. Also it's, very, also, it's very important to develop societal resilience and use um, asymmetric tools against your adversary also. That means to it, it's a good idea to explore the vulnerability of your adversary and to counteract uh, hybrid uh, threats uh, using this kind of approach. Also, it's very important to have common understanding and the regional level regarding uh, uh, building command, common response, because uh, now current situation show us that uh, civil societies at the regional level have a lot of study, did a lot of study regarding uh, the common understanding of hybrid region, especially at a trilateral level between Romania, uh, between Georgia, Republic of Moldova and Ukraine. Also, we have a different program where it's involved uh, uh, country, member country of, of European Union of NATO as Romania. But we have to understand that the hybrid freeze in the context of your uh, Eastern partnership area, um, they have the same sources, but the intensity could be a different. Also the country will have a different level of fragility of state, of stability of state. Uh, country promote at different level the democracy, but why it's very important to have a common understanding at the same time to understand that we are different. That's why if you analyze current situation in the region, uh, beyond the meetings at the high level as in Crimea or um, uh, meetings um, at high level in, in Batumi, for example, now civil society understand that we have to be more stronger and promote at the free level, the relation between Republic of Moldova, Ukraine and Georgia, and not, of, not only between this kind of country, to ensure security in the region uh, using a conception, a strong more geopolitical Europe. Also, it's very important instrument now in current situation, it is to promote um, the reform of uh, institution of, uh, uh, of uh, legal institution, also to promote reform in the security and defense uh, system. The most important uh, approach in the region, it is a building resilience. Building resilience, it's more difficult because it is also a comprehensive approach. Uh, we have to build resilience at different level, not only resilience regarding fighting the um, crisis uh, or uh, the threats uh, uh, after pandemics crisis COVID-19, but also it is important to understand when we need re resilience regarding uh, ecological security. For example, Republic of Moldova now uh, discuss situation uh, regarding, uh, regarding the arrival in Nist uh, uh, and the building the um, um, energetic, uh, sorry, I forget the uh, on Nestrovsk, um, uh, Ukrainian build the uh, hydroenergetics um, Oh, how to take uh, to translate? Um, sorry, sorry for this uh, difficult difficulty to translate the word. Uh, 
Also, it's very important to have resilience uh, in uh, regarding energy security. Now it is very relevant for Republic of Moldova, but not only, I think it's a re regional level too. And uh, it's very important to have a common understanding regarding resilience at the cyber, regarding cyber security in the region. And uh, it is very complex issues, not, all, not complicated, but complex issues. And uh, here I will finish my presentation and thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you very much, Natalia, for your presentation. Uh, and uh, now I want to give floor uh, to our uh, last speaker for today's panel, uh, Mr. Andreas Umland from Stockholm Center for Eastern European Studies. So, Andreas, floor is yours. Many thanks, Andrew. Um, there is a, a temptation to speak here from Kiev. I'm sitting in Kiev. Um, I'm not in Stockholm. I'm working in for a Stockholm Center, but I, I still live in Kiev so far. Um, there's a temptation to speak here about the uh, current situation, and I'm certainly very worried by it, but just maybe to, to deal with that, um, I hope that it will not escalate. And um, I think the crucial, um, the crucial uh, factor is going to be here how credible the Western, um, Western announcement uh, about sanctions that will be imposed on Russia in, in case of a military escalation will be and how, how serious they will be taken in, in Moscow. The sad, um, the sad experience um, so far has been that the West has not been very active in using sanctions. Uh, Natalia um, Albu can, of course, most, uh, so to say, report about this. Uh, there were never any serious sanctions uh, on Russia in connection with the uh, Russian troops, uh, the illegal Russian troops on uh, Moldovan territory. There have been very minor sanctions um, in 2008 when Russian troops moved into, uh, uh, officially moved into, um, on, on Georgian um, soil. And in 2014, um, there were um, individual sanctions and then there were the sanctions against Crimea um, and the problem here with the sanctions was that the uh, sectoral sanctions that were finally adopted on 29th of July 2014 uh, were minor uh, as well, and um, they were obviously a re result of the, uh, not of the killing of Ukrainians and the, um, and the occupation of, of Ukraine, but they were a result obviously of the killing of over 200 EU citizens and they were um, a reaction to that. Um, if you look at the type of sanctions that were imposed over 2014 and the sequence of the various sanctions that were opposed in 2014, then the message is very clear that uh, what Putin should not do is uh, killing EU citizens. Uh, that is the main message, so to say, of the, of the, um, of the sanctions policy uh, you can, as Putin could, as uh, president of Russia, go to the Bundestag and give a speech to the Bundestag and get ovations from the Bundestag at a time when Russian troops were illegally stationed in Moldova and, in fact, also on Georgian soil um, in Abkhazia in 2001. But if you, sh if you kill EU citizens, that is bad, and um, then you'll get sanctions, uh, although even these sanctions were only minor. So if now the, the West can communicate to Putin that um, the sanctions are going to come even without killing uh, Western citizens um, and that they will not be minor, then I hope that the escalation can be uh, avoided. So um, that's basically my, my short message on the current situation here in, uh, in, in Ukraine and just to get it off, so to say, off the table. I want to speak about something uh, very far away in a way uh, and, and very remote, but I think something that has not been uh, mentioned yet and that is in generally not yet discussed. And these are the new risks in terms of um, the uh, approximation and the association and the integration uh, of Moldova, um, Georgia and Ukraine with the European Union and with NATO that are now arising uh, 
uh, with the new situation in Poland and Hungary and the new possibilities that um, the situation in Poland and Hungary is also giving to, um, to Russia for uh, disinformation, for um, uh, active measures, for reflexive control operations, namely uh, that um, Poland and Hungary are currently doing not only themselves a dis and the European Union and the European project a disservice with their uh, domestic policies, but they are also doing um, a disservice to such countries as um, Moldova, Georgia and Ukraine in that they create distrust in, um, in Brussels, in Western Europe about the future of uh, further Eastern enlargement and because they basically confirm something that we already know um, from uh, the events that have happened over the last 20 years in Russia namely that the uh, once also in Russia announced um, uh, aspirations to build a common European home, to, um, to uh, bring uh, Russia back to Europe, uh, that Russia may become a, a NATO member, that all of these announcements that we know from the 1990s that were made um, are, um, are not true as it turns out. But also with regard to other East European countries, it now turns out that, the, um, that there was a certain misunderstanding from the beginning about the nature of the European project and about the nature of European integration on, of the European Union. And uh, this creates, I think, enormous risks for such countries as Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova. I think they have um, a justified um, hope that the implementation of the association agreements will bring them closer to Europe and that a full um, implementation of the association agreements will by itself uh, um, uh, create the question of their political accession to the European Union once uh, they have basically been already integrated into the economic and legal uh, space. But what we have been observing lately in Poland and Hungary is both in terms of sort of the objective situation and in terms of the new sort of weak spots that this creates for um, countries like Russia um, uh, is, uh, I think, creating enormous risk because they, it's, it, it's basically creating an impression that um, we have, um, uh, so to say, in the West, a, a principle, a fundamental misunderstanding about the European project. This was already something that we or earlier learned with Russia, but now we are also learning with Poland and Hungary this and, and now this distrust, um, I'm afraid, will be also transferring to Moldova, to Georgia and to Ukraine as possible future um, candidates for uh, EU membership and NATO membership. And oddly, there is even here a moment in that um, Hungary is currently sabotaging, boycotting the um, NATO-Ukraine relations, which is also in a very odd and very bizarre way, then creating new distrust in general towards Eastern, Eastern Europe and also including Ukraine in that um, the, I think the impression that many people now get in Brussels and in other Western capitals is that you cannot trust the East Europeans because they may say that they like Europe, as Gorbachev once said and, uh, and, and Yeltsin was sa once said. and and even Putin once said, and as of course all, all the um, other East European leaders once said, but when push comes to shove, uh, when it then comes to actually showing intra-EU solidarity in accepting uh, supranational institutions in the EU, in uh, accepting um, the primacy of EU law over national law, then it act actually becomes more and more difficult. And um, that is something that I'm afraid will uh, be also noticed by Russia, um, and uh, that is um, an entry point for future Russian uh, hybrid measures for re reflexive control uh, operations that I think uh, will be something uh, developing and that uh, Russia will certainly certainly not be missing. In a way, I, I could be accused here of giving away um, um, a brilliant idea to um, Russian hybrid warriors in suggesting to use, uh, so to say, the um, the declining image of Eastern Europe uh, for, uh, for hybrid attacks on, on, on Ukraine. But in fact, I've recently experienced that this is already happening, that Russia has actually already drawn um, this conclusion that you can play on this. 
um, I've been recently um, been sort of uh, in a very bizarre way a part of it in uh, that you may have noticed that uh, that there was a German politician who in con uh, in connection with the uh, with the um, refugee crisis in Belarus was um, suggesting that Ukraine would uh, take the refugees from Belarus and thereby help um, uh, the EU and the refugees and in a way perhaps even Belarus um, to get over with this problem. Yeah? And the, um, the reaction to this was extremely negative here in, in Ukraine. And um, I have then suggested that this was a, this was a, a mistake. Um, I think that uh, was an unstrategic, I would say, reaction by Ukraine to this um, suggestion, because that is basically something that Ukraine would have to do anyway. If it becomes a member of the European Union, it will. Um, it will. It should not uh, behave like Hungary and and Poland, and will have to take part in in uh, taking care of the refugees that are, are coming to the European Union, and of course to the European Union, um, there are coming much more, uh, many more refugees than to to Ukraine. Um, but uh, my my then suggestion that this was a tr strategic mistake by Ukraine to react in this way and to, and to show itself uncooperative in this situ uh, in this situation became extremely popular in Russia. So I've I've checked uh, uh, just uh, you know the the Russian internet and I was I was quoted hundreds of times with with uh, this uh, suggestion that basically the EU is pressuring uh, Ukraine here to. Um, uh, to submit to certain decisions um, uh, to be taken in Brussels and to get its uh, polit political sovereignty uh, diminished, so to say. This is, of course, uh, not what, uh, what, uh, the, um, what the message was, but this is indicating, I think, um, uh, a new field of future uh, disinformation wars that is emerging in that, um, that Russia will, tr will be trying to um, to use the declining image, so to say, of Eastern Europe, that unfortunately countries like Poland and Hungary have recently um, been advancing to uh, to to create distrust in uh, in Brussels, and also to use perhaps certain um, uh, stereotypes and certain styles of thinking, I would say, in countries like. Ukraine, Georgia, and Russia, uh, and, and, uh, and, Mo and Moldova to, uh, to uh, conduct reflexive control uh, uh, operations and to thereby then um, uh, uh, also damage uh, the future integration of these three countries into the European Union. Maybe that's a slightly long-winded and um, uh, slightly remote also remark that I'm making here, but I've, I've also thought I maybe speak about this because um, the uh, the focus of the conference is very fairly narrow, which is very good. But um, uh, I may have now risen, uh, uh, spoken here about a topic that uh, I suppose I have not been on all the panels has not been uh, yet uh, spoken about. Maybe I'll conclude with that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, and uh, now we start in our discussion. Uh, uh, we. Uh, 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 now have possibility to uh, uh, ask questions from the speakers uh, and uh, uh, they will appear in the chat. So as a moderator, I will use my opportunity uh, to ask the first question. I think uh, I will start from Mr. Grant, but uh, really it is a question to all speakers about, uh, of course, current situation. Yeah, and uh, 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 we will see a virtual meeting between uh, Putin and Biden uh, on December 7 or 8. Uh, and uh, during this uh, event, uh, Putin will ask uh, from the West some security assurances. Yeah, for Russia, it's uh, very interesting uh, that uh, Russia asks security assurances. Uh, but uh, we understand that it's about Ukraine, it's about uh, Ukraine no, na natural status, and we are talking about uh, maybe some Finlandization, yes, uh, of Ukraine. But my, um, I think that uh, it's more about Belarusization of Ukraine. Uh, 
And uh, my question, uh, what do you think? What exactly Russia wants uh, from this meeting? Because we already have seen this meeting uh, in um, uh, summer, yeah, between uh, Putin and Biden, and now we don't uh, see any implications, and now we see another uh, escalation. Uh, so what is happening and uh, what we can expect from this uh, meeting? So thank you. I'm going to be contentious and say that actually Putin doesn't want something from the meeting other than knowing that America is not going to put troops into Ukraine. And therefore, a, a point that I would come back, uh, which I think Andrea, Andrea started with about, about sanctions, I think he wants to hear that there will be sanctions. Because if he hears that there will be sanctions, it means there won't be troops. And therefore, it's a reverse. He wants to hear that there will be sanctions because then he can come in. What he doesn't want to hear from Biden is if you cross that line, mate, I'm putting 80, you know, uh, 80 parachute brigade or whatever, 82nd Airborne in, into, 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 uh, into Ukraine. Um, and that the fact that if he hears something other than that, then I think he'll come in. Um, or he can come in. He hasn't got to. He can come in. Um, and I think this is one of the things that I, I think that, that people miss a point on. That he's got to take Ukraine. He can't. He can't move against NATO, and he can't move against the EU until he's got Ukraine in the in in the bag. He's got Belarus in the bag. That was the easy one. Now he's got to get the difficult one because without those two, then basically he's not in a position to actually to. To, 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 to take the others. It's too too much, too much to bite. Uh, and therefore, what he's looking for is to hear that nobody's going to interfere and, and actually stop him doing this. Um, because he's coming. He's coming. You don't spend that much money. Follow the money. You don't spend that much money. You don't shift 100, 150,000 troops. You pull in reserves and bring your tanks. You don't do that for nothing. You do it if you're rehearsing. Yes. But there a, comes a point after two rehearsals or three rehearsals where the troops are ready to do something and then he's going to do it. And the only thing that will stop him is knowing that, that NATO and everybody is going to cross the frontier and fight him. And therefore, he's looking for assurances that they're not going to fight. That's what he wants from the Biden meeting. Which may not be a very popular thing to say, but I'm sorry, people. You know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> he's, a sol he's a soldier and he's spending money and he's spending money for, for one purpose and one person on purpose only, Ukraine. Uh, thank you, Glenn. Uh, Andres? Yes, obviously I have a more optimistic uh, view on this thing, as I already indicated. Uh, what also leads me um, to um, see here the sanctions and the economic reper repercussions with more um uh with more optimism or with you know that they have more punch uh, than apparently glenn thinks um is a research by maria snegovaya she has um studied um the uh, relationship between um so so to say foreign adventurism both of the um uh, Russian elite and and Russian common people in relation to socioeconomic situation and and the lesson basically from her articles on this is that Russians are inclined to be adventurous in international affairs when when the socioeconomic situation is good and uh, so this was also the lesson from 2008 in 2014 the interventions in in Georgia and in Ukraine happened when uh, just before the uh, for the before the economic uh, crisis um, of 2008 and then the, the fall of the um, oil prices in 2014 when it seemed that you can do something like that um, if there are now indeed uh, real sanctions coming um, in reaction to um, uh, to an intervention um, i would think you know putin is not only a soldier he's also a politician so this is going to be then risky for Putin. And I think they, they know that this is going to be risky. If you have a, a sharp decline 
um, uh, of the ruble if you have then uh, maybe a bank run or something like that in um, once you start a, an, o an open inter interstate war uh, against Ukraine that may be from my point of view actually enough because we I mean the lesson so far has been that with Moldova no sanction is at all with Georgia practically no sanctions in 2008 and with, with, with Ukraine only serious sectoral sanctions after EU citizens have been killed, not, not, about, not about after Ukrainian citizens have been killed, not even after the annexation of Crimea. The, the, the first sanctions round on Crimea was just about Crimea. It was not actually hitting um, the, the, the Russian economy. So, um, so the these, these sort of sequence and types of sanctions that we've observed so far, or the absence of, sa of sanctions, leads me to be more, more optimistic here on the economic instruments. Uh, thank you, Andreas. Uh, and uh, yeah, and now indeed uh, there is a publication that Russia wants to sell to Ukraine and Kyiv. Yes, of course. Uh, so uh, I think we will move um, uh, to, to next topics. Yes, and I, I have uh, uh, a question uh, uh, to Miss Emily uh, about uh, uh, NATO, uh, about Germany and NATO uh, reactive policy towards uh, uh, Russian disinformation campaigns, uh, cyber attacks, and uh, what do you think uh, in NATO strategic concept uh, that will be adopted next year? Uh, uh, what will be changes? Yeah, can NATO, Germany, and other NATO countries uh, change this approach that they react, not uh, making proactive policy towards this threat? Well, thank you for the question. Well, it's it's difficult to say. As for Germany, next week we'll probably, or I guess most likely, have a new government. And of course, in advance, they were saying they're going to be more strict or be like more um, confrontamental than the government uh, with Angela Merkel, our, well, Chancellor who she is now, but not next week anymore. So, but always what people say before they get into power and then what happens when they are actually in power. So at the moment, what we're going to say for Germany is quite difficult um, to predict um, because, yeah, we, we just have to see and wait what's going to happen. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, uh, and uh, my next question to Natalia, uh, it's uh, yeah, about... Uh, really uh, uh, situation in Moldova and um, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, like a watcher yeah, who is uh, um, uh, watching what is happening in Moldova but I'm interested uh, uh, what is about support for European integration and uh, do you have this discussion about NATO membership uh, because uh, seven years ago when I was in Moldova NATO was like uh, very uh, prohibited topic uh, and uh, uh, no, no one was talking about it. Uh, and uh, another question about uh, you know, what do you think about regional formats that are forming uh, in Eastern Europe? Uh, uh, we have seen uh, some um, uh, meeting of uh, Polish, Ukrainian, Romanian uh, and Moldovan presidents uh, during uh, uh, celebration of your independence. Uh, so what do you think? Uh, um, uh, is there a possibility to form such new alliances? in this region. Okay, thank you very much for the question. Uh, uh, first of all, regarding uh, NATO integration. Um, in Republic of Moldova, we don't discuss uh, at the national and the, edu uh, at the academia uh, level uh, the NATO integration because we use very successfully, so-called successfully, uh, neutrality concept. Uh, also, uh, this summer uh, was done um, perception barometer and they integrated the issues regarding NATO and partnership of NATO and security issues. And the population uh, don't think about uh, NATO integration, only collaboration or uh, security issues for short period of time. Uh, people are more friendly of, uh, with idea to have strong collaboration with uh, European Union 
Uh, and because uh, not only a lot of uh, uh, that our citizens uh, work uh, abroad uh, in the European uh, countries, uh, but also because now we have more strong strategic communication regarding European collaboration. But at the beginning, related to your question, at the beginning, I raised the hand uh, regarding the um, argument or statement uh, of Andreas Umland regarding the misunderstanding the European program in the region. And I agree with him. The perception of population regarding collaboration with NATO of Euro or European Union in the Republic of Moldova very related with how government communicate this uh, kind of vision. Because unfortunately at the national level, uh, we don't have still uh, today, we don't have a clear uh, strategic vision how to defend our country. We don't have a strategic vision, European Union or NATO. Uh, another question. NATO, yes, it is a uh, taboo issue in our day and current political situation. And only we discuss as a positive, uh, a, a negative approach during the election. Now we have an information documentation center that launched a lot of uh, activities regarding to promote security culture. And it is very easy to discuss about security when you are not a member or expert from this center. Because if you are expert of, uh, for example, me, I'm an associated expert at that uh, center. And when uh, I represent uh, the security issues, always people think that I promote uh, NATO integration. Yes, it is a perception of country. Regarding the collaboration at the regional level, it's very sensitive issues uh, because um, we are at the same time we have this, the same fleet. If you speak an actor about an actor, it is a Russian Federation, and all instruments that Russian Federation use against to dominate to influence in the region. But we are different. And uh, we have a different perception regarding free. We have uh, a different instrument that we use to promote our nation, national interest. Yes, we have a common situation regarding the non-solved conflict, so-called um, frozen negotiation process. But it's very important uh, how we promote this kind of perception. And the regional level, uh, it is a very strong argument, this kind of collaboration between Republic of Moldova, Ukraine, Polish, and uh, Romania. Uh, I think very um, realistic that we have um, a strong argument to keep this collaboration. And it's very strong instrument to solve and to contribute to our resilience. But it's very important to work with our people. It's very important to have common understanding why we need this kind of collaboration. And I will show you uh, one example. Uh, it's very interesting in the context of uh, energy, energy security of a country and uh, the tools that apply Russian Federation regarding price of gas, yes. Uh, students from the military academy ask me, why Poland give us this support regarding uh, a gas. Yes, they delivered some quantity of uh, gas uh, and support Republic of Moldova. And they think it is something they need from us. They think about it is um, hybrid tools, but they don't ask why uh, Russian Federation use kind instrument price for gas as a hybrid tools. They think bad about immediate partners. We don't think about Russian Federation. And the success of this kind of relation depends on strategic communication, I think. At the state, people between states, and very important actor here, it is European Union. Because um, um, Andres uh, Umland emphasized how it is important the perceptions from, from the country. In my country, still another day, they ask, they don't understand the um, 
program of the European Union program as the institutional capacity building, for example, we have for Ministry of Internal Affairs. We have a different, we have a program building um, confidence building in Transnistria, but still in our day, we don't have common understanding regarding the results of which kind of programs. And I think it is miscommunication between European Union and Republic of Moldova. It is uh, we don't have strong communication or a plan, a action plan regarding communication and promote, promote this kind of, of a cavity from government to people. And also, we don't have so strong so civil societies in the region. This is a main challenge to have uh, a strong collaboration regarding between all these countries from the region. Uh, thank you, Natalia. Uh, um, in this format, yes, we uh, don't have enough uh, time uh, yeah, to talk all, all, the, all the issues, yes. Uh, and um, now maybe possibility, yes, to say uh, some other remarks uh, for the speakers, if you, if you have uh, any. Uh, if uh, not, uh, you can raise hands or uh, show me uh, like... <laughs> Okay, Mr. Grant. Not so much a, not so much a, a, a last re remark as a question to to Emily. But why why Germany should be subject to the most disinformation? Uh, do you think that that's because uh, they, they they've got a weak political system and therefore can be easily abused, or or what? It's very strange to me. Well, I, I hope we do not have a weak political system, <laughs> at least from the inside, I, I do not think we do have one. Well, first of all, I mean, I've asked myself actually the same question and uh, many people within Germany have, and there are lots of different opinions about it. But first of all, I mean, first of all, we do have more than 80 million uh, inhabitants within Germany, so we are the largest population within uh, EU. So, and a big economical power. So, this might be the reason why there is some interest within or for Germany, right? And then we do have um, a huge Russian minority, and um, actually, I mean, I said there are more than three million people who actually can speak Russian. So I guess there is some target audience, uh, which is quite easy to access. Yes, so I guess this is, this is one of the reasons or easier than maybe other, other groups. And um, then I think it's because of our history as well. And within um, our politics, there are really like important politicians, like for example, leaders of some of the federal states who are really um, outspoken, and like talk very positively about Russia, about Russian politics. And um, I mean, obviously they are not like, you know, in favor of Putin, but they are always saying like, we need to cooperate, we need to continue dialogue. And obviously this is important, but there is quite a strong division within politics. Yes. So I think this is, this is another reason. And we call them like, you know, the people who understand Russia. Yes, so we do have quite a, a big um, fraction of people um, who understand, yes, let me put it in brackets, Russia. So this is quite a big discourse within Germany. And then what we have seen now, um, well, generally speaking, and now with the COVID-19 pandemic as well, within Germany, there are there is a potential for people who believe in con conspiracy theories. Yes, for example, um, we have six, about, the numbers are not exact, but about 69% of our population is fully vaccinated, which is not a lot. We are talking about making it mandatory to get vaccinated because our hospitals, there are so many patients and um, we might get actually to the end of the capacity. Yes. And um, so this is now, media is, is, is full of that and the situation really we have a lot of people are uh, infected because so many people do not want to get vaccinated. And um, it's because lots of people believe in conspiracy theories and do not trust 
uh, vaccinations. So I think it's you can't answer that question quite easily with uh, just one answer, but um, that's that's like my approach to the topic and why I think that Germany is uh, targeted quite a lot. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, before before I give floor to Mr. Umland, uh, I can specify this figure: three million people Russian speaking. Um, I, I I know that uh, five years ago it was figure about six million people. So what has happened? It's official figure or not? It, oh no, I, I need I need to specify. So it's people. I mean, there are a lot of people who actually can speak Russian and whose mother tongue is Russian. Yes. So and um, there are way more people who can speak Russian that, uh, um, than whose mother tongue it is. Yes. So it's even larger. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Mr. Umlad. Yes, I think it's uh, the situation is even worse than Amelie just um, just outlined. Um, there's a, a brilliant book by John Love just published, um, Germany's Russia Problem, which is about the the longer term strange affinities of um, um, that uh, Germans have to Russia. Obviously, there's also um, uh, many economic stakes. It's not just that Germany is the largest economy of Europe, but it's also for for Russia an important. Uh, economy, it's not as uh, not, Russia is not as important for Germany as, as some people think, but for Russia, Germany is is important. And the, then there are a number of other pathologies apart from those that were mentioned by Emily that make Russian discourse, um, a, a German discourse, sort of vulnerable to Russian disinformation, like uh, pacifism, anti-Americanism, and uh, something I can freely say here as a being an East German, that there is a big problem in East Germany with uh, political culture, I would say in general, reflected in the high high percentage that, uh, that the AfD and Die Linke are getting. So there's a lot of playground in Germany. I think that's one of the reasons also why why I think it's fairly logical, actually, for the Kremlin to invest here, especially in, in, in Germany. I would, you know, I would have thought even that there could be more, <laughs> if you like, um, to be done in, uh, it's, it's easier to do in No, I need, I need to specify. So it's people, I mean, Germany than in Britain, let's say. Uh, thank you. So, Emily, you want to clarify what, no? Oh no, um, I, I just actually want to say, yes, yes, I do agree. There, there definitely is, is a playground. I mean, it depends. I think it's not only in the Eastern part of Germany where, I mean, yes, because of the history, there is a bigger playing field, but um, then it generally widens to, to, to um, the whole of Germany. Yes, but there is, um, there's a, a lot of uh, potential. Uh, thank you very much, and I want to thank you all our speakers uh, and participants for uh, this uh, online panel. Yes, I hope uh, that uh, next time we will have very good offline meetings. Uh, and uh, now I want yeah, to, to wish you a good call, a good uh, weekend, and um, uh, I want to thank your organizers one more time for this event. So thank you, and uh, see you next time. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much.